Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Clyde Prestowitz, who is president and founder of the Economic Strategy Institute in Washington, D.C. His publications include Trading Places and Rogue Nation. He has just published Three Billion New Capitalists, The Great Shift of Wealth and Power to the East. Clyde, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Nice to be here. Where were you born and raised? In Wilmington, Delaware. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, my dad worked for a Belgian company and was always traveling through some exotic place. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really got me interested in the world. Um, <clears throat> my dad was uh, uh, kind of, uh, languages were his hobby. Got me interested in, in languages. and. Uh, and so um, both my mom and dad were very much internationally oriented and it kind of got me that way as well. And, and you're multilingual, I think I saw in your VTech, correct? Well, I hack at a number of different languages, yeah. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and where were you educated? Well, I did my undergraduate work at Swarthmore College and then I did graduate work at the East-West Center at the University of Hawaii, uh, Keio University in Tokyo, and I uh, got an MBA at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. In your book, and one gets a sense that, that you're very uh, conscious of, of what your generation was able to achieve because of the success of the American economy and its role in the world. Talk a little about that. Well, of course, Tom Brokaw wrote the great book, The Greatest Generation, about our, my fathers, um, our fathers. And I guess I would say if that was the greatest generation, we were the luckiest generation. Uh, we hit the sweet spot of uh, American economic history. Uh, America emerged from the Second World War as incomparably the overwhelming uh, economic power. In fact, in 1948, the U.S. all by itself accounted for more than half of global output. We were the leader in every technology and in every industry. Uh, the U.S. was the only mass market. So <clears throat> we had enormous economies of scale. And we could be the low-cost producer and pay the highest wages. Um, when I graduated from high school, uh, most of my class just walked down the street and went on the assembly line at the local General Motors assembly plant. Um, I saw many of these people recently at uh, a recent reunion, and they're all retired. <clears throat> and they have uh, defined benefit pension plans, they have indexed health care, mm -hmm. most of them have uh, a house at the beach or a house in the mountains, uh, sent all their kids to college, most of their kids are doctors or lawyers or professionals of some kind, and they did all that with a high school education. Um, just really very, very fortunate generation. Mm -hmm. now, now, what led you into business? You said your father was a businessman. Was just inevitable? I mean, just come naturally for you to uh, seek a business? Uh, no, actually, I initially, I started as a journalist. Uh, and uh, I worked for the Wilmington Morning News and the Honolulu Star Bulletin. Then I went into the Foreign Service. Um, interesting uh, tidbit there. I. I passed the language exams uh, of the Foreign Service in Japanese. They assigned me to the U.S. Consulate in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> That's a natural match, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I spent a couple of years uh, in, uh, in the Rotterdam and in The Hague. And then I came back, I left the Foreign Service, I came back uh, from Holland in 1968, and I had gone to Swarthmore on a scholarship funded by a man named Tom McCabe, who was the longtime chairman of Scott Paper Company. And uh, I had lunch with McCabe, and was trying to figure out kind of what to do. I had applied to law school and I'd done some other things. And after talking to McCabe, I decided to try business. And so I went to work for Scott Paper Company in 1968. And actually uh, was with Scott for a number of years and then with some other companies before joining the Reagan administration in 1981. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in working for, a, a, in essence, a multinational corporation uh, during that period, I'm <clears throat> talk a little about that. Give us a feel for that, because uh, America was, and a company like Scott was the player, you know, especially in the European market. Oh, right? yeah. In fact, um, when I was uh, first in, in Europe in the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, the book that everybody was talking about was Le Défi Américain. The American Challenge, written by Jean-Jacques Jean mm -hmm. Servan-Schreiber, um, French uh, journalist, 
And the whole thrust of that book was that the American multinational corporations were basically taking over the world. Uh, and uh, uh, Schreiber made the point in, in his book that the, the biggest um, single enti uh, industrial entity in Europe were the American companies operating in Europe. And they were more European and operated on more of a European scale than any of the European companies, which I found to be true in my own experience. When I worked with Scott uh, Paper, and I, I also worked with Scott in Brussels, um, in fact, it was true. Among the paper companies, we were more oriented to the European market than any of our uh, competitors. And uh, of course, uh, what was happening at that time was that the uh, American companies were leaders in technology coming off of the momentum of the Second World War. Uh, and uh, they were uh, very powerful because they were coming off of the base of the US market where they had these enormous economies of scale. Uh, the dollar was strong. Remember that the dollar value in those days was they were we had fixed exchange rates, and the dollar had been fixed to be very strong, uh, partly as a way of enabling the Europeans to, and the Japanese to recover from the war by exporting to U.S. market. But it meant that the, the American companies could easily acquire uh, European or other Asian companies. So there was a lot of acquisition, and this was really uh, what I think of as a second wave of globalization. The first wave having been begun with, uh, with Henry the Navigator and the, and the development of the European empires beginning in the 15th century and lasting until the First World War. Mm -hmm. Now, at, at what point in, in this, uh, b before we move to a discussion of your new book and the, the new <clears throat> wave of globalization, uh, let's look at some of the, <clears throat> the uh, problems with some of American policy, because the emphasis began in this second wave of globalization to emphasize consumption, right, on the part of the American right. consumer, and, and with less uh, concern with investment. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, immediately after the Second World War, uh, of course, you have to keep in mind the kind of the mental environment of the time. All of the leaders uh, of our country and other countries in the mid-1940s, they had just come through the war, but before that, they'd been through the Depression. Uh, and of course, the war had stimulated enormous economic growth, but they still had in their minds the Depression. And so there was a great fear that with the end of wartime production, the economy would lapse back into recession or even depression. And uh, so all of the uh, thinking at the time was how do we how do we keep this economic growth going? And remember, we had 15 million men in uniform, and all of those men were being demobilized and coming back into the economy. How were they going to be employed? What were we going to do with them? That was really the pressing economic question of the time. And so uh, leaders began to dream up all kinds of ways to stimulate the economy. Uh, and of course, we got the GI Bill, and we got uh, various kinds of aid for, for people to buy houses. This was the beginning of Levittown and, uh, and uh, mass uh, kind of housing. Uh, uh, mortgages were made easy to get with low down payments. Uh, consumer credit was loosened up so that uh, families could buy on time uh, and, and deduct the interest on those on time purchases from their taxes. So we began to build a structure in the US that really subsidized consumption. Uh, in order not to lapse back into a depression and to maintain strong economic growth so that we could provide jobs for all these men coming back out of, um, out of the armed forces. Uh, we're going to come back to this theme again and again, namely what America does and cannot do and chooses not to do. But one other point for this period of the U.S. Uh, uh, policy during the second wave of globalization that seems to be important and emerges from your writings is the notion that the concerns of the government for national security led it to take uh, a guiding role, a leading role as a result of defense and other kinds of needs in the Cold War uh, that also contributed 
to uh, helping the economy boom and make the technological investment necessary. Talk a little about that. Well, I think there were two uh, things going on here. Of course, during the, uh, as a result of the, the depression and the efforts to get out of the depression, and then as a result of the war, um, there had grown up a very collaborative and cooperative uh, relationship between the government and industry and labor. Uh, and um, much of the uh, technological, rapid technological development that took place during the war, of course, involved collaboration, close collaboration between government and industry, uh, and that carried over into the post-war period. And uh, of course, the outbreak of the Cold War, which led to renewed emphasis on armed forces and on national security, and because the U.S. Um, did not have the large forces that the Russians and the Chinese had at the time, uh, we bet on technology as our national security uh, guarantee. Uh, but that bet on technology then meant that the collaboration between industry and government continued quite strongly. Uh, and so you had the growth of, for example, the defense the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA. very DARPA. Uh, none of us today could live without our email. Uh, it's hard to imagine life, even though we lived most, of, I lived most of my life, you did too, without uh, email or the internet, hard to imagine living without it now. Mm -hmm. The internet came from DARPA. Uh, and DARPA was created after the Russians launched Sputnik as the first satellite. Uh, that was seen as a threat to American technological leadership. DARPA jumped into uh, the gap and led an effort to reassert American leadership. And out of that, one of the things that came out of that is today's internet. So there was this very collaborative uh, relationship. Secondly, another very important aspect of the post-war economic scene was that in internationally, the focus of the United States was um, on re helping to rebuild and reconstruct uh, Europe uh, and Japan and the rest of Asia from the devastation of the war. Uh, it was assumed that the U.S. superiority in technology and industrial productivity uh, would last a long time. In fact, I think it was kind of assumed that it would last forever because there was just a natural right of being an American. So little thought was given to American competitiveness or maintaining American industrial or technological leadership. And the U.S. government called together American business leaders, urged them to uh, develop suppliers abroad. Uh, I remember talking to Bob Galvin, the ch former chairman of uh, Motorola, telling me that uh, he had been in meetings with President Eisenhower. And uh, there had been discussions uh, between the president and business leaders about um, the need to develop suppliers from Japan or from Europe. And even if their quality wasn't really up to snuff, or even mm -hmm. if their productivity wasn't really up to snuff, help them, mm -hmm. uh, teach them what to do. Mm -hmm. um, when I was assigned to the U.S. Uh, consulate in Rotterdam, and then I worked at the U.S. Embassy in The Hague, this is 1966, 1967. My assignment was to help promote Dutch exports to the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, this was after the Japanese miracle of 1964. This mm -hmm. was after, you know, the uh, the, the Wirtschaftswunder, the uh, economic miracle of Germany in the 1960s. This was after strong recovery in Europe. American Foreign Service officers were being told to help promote exports. This is we had uh, these days we had a trade deficit. We were already having beginning a trade deficit mm -hmm. in the late 1960s, but American diplomats were out there promoting foreign exports to the U.S. market. So that was the mentality. So and, and it was a, it, it seems like the, the primary concern would have been national security ones to support it, it, to rebuild and right and rebuild to, and help our allies get strong yeah. and to in order to face off against the uh, Soviets and the Chinese. Absolutely. Well, let's now talk about your new book. It's called Three Billion New Capitalists, The Great Shift of Wealth and Power uh, to the East. Uh, and it is a map for us of the new landscape of the very uh, different uh, international economy uh, that we are uh, confronting. You talk about it as the uh, 
the third wave of globalization. What are the defining characteristics uh, uh, of this new wave? Well, you know, we've been talking about globalization for a long time, but the interesting thing is that it, it, the term is not accurate. Uh, half of the world has been out of the global system. Uh, the Chinese, the Soviet bloc, the Indians all chose a communist or socialist system, uh, and they constitute three billion people, and for most of the past 60 years, they have not been part of the global system. So part of this new phenomenon is that globalization is going global. <laughs> and we've had these three billion people suddenly in the last 10, 12 years come into the global economy. Uh, this is unique just in terms of the magnitude. Uh, if you think about Japan essentially coming into the global economy in the 1950s, 1960s. Think of the impact of that. Huge impact. Small country, 130 million people. Mm -hmm. In the 70s and 80s, the tigers of Asia, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. Tiny countries. Big impact. Now we're talking 3 billion, China, India, the whole former Soviet bloc, all coming in at once. The impact of this is going to be unprecedented. Um, even more so because there's a unique aspect of these 3 billion people. Uh, we have developed in our, uh, in our models of economic development, we have a paradigm uh, of development proceeding from countries that are poor uh, with a lot of unskilled labor and they begin by focusing on labor intensive production, textiles and shoes and toys uh, where you need low skill and cheap labor and then they uh, gradually acquire skills and they move up the uh, hierarchy of value added. Um, these three billion people that we're talking about, most of them are poor, most of them are unskilled. But a small percentage of three billion is still a big number. And there is uh, a population among these three billion of 300 million or 400 million, more than the population of the United States, uh, who are every bit as skilled, who are every bit as well educated as anybody in the first world. In fact, Many of them have been educated here at Berkeley or at Caltech or Stanford or MIT or Harvard or what have you. Uh, and they can do anything that can be done in Japan or the US or Europe and they can do it for 20 cents on the dollar. So this is a unique moment when a large number of people are coming into the global system and many of them are offering high skills and, and, and low cost. And this is something we haven't seen much before in the global economy. This is happening in conjunction with a second revolution, which is the negation of time and distance. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that can be done digitally can be done anywhere in the world and delivered anywhere else in the world in two seconds. Speed of light. Bangalore to Berkeley, two seconds. Uh, and even if you're working in, still working in the old world of molecules and atoms and you know you actually make things and you have to physically deliver them, uh, anything can be made anywhere in the world and picked up and delivered by FedEx anywhere else in the world in maximum 36 hours. So time and distance have gone away. So these 3 billion people and these 300, 400 million people who are highly skilled and low cost are right in that seat, right next mm -hmm. door, uh, which changes the competitive dynamics enormously. You know, today, sitting here in Berkeley, your competitor may be uh, another, in another state, but may just as easily be mm -hmm. 3,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. and, and bottom line here, if we go back to this discussion of your graduating class, uh, when we started to lose those kinds of jobs and that kind of security, the idea was, okay, we'll stop with the man, you know, not, let's not worry about manufacturing, we'll move into services. Right. And now what, we're, what you're describing is that these services, for example, or financial services can move to India That's basically exactly right. because of the yeah. internet. And the internet, which you already discussed, which we helped create. Right, exactly. Now, and we helped create this internet thing, largely as a matter of national security. Um, and it has become, of course, a global uh, tool, which, uh, you know, in, in some ways, uh, is.
uh, changing the competitive dynamics in a way that right now is, is uh, creating enormous challenges for the United States. But I think a really important point that you uh, alluded to here is the services thing, because for a long time, manufacturing has been leaving uh, the U.S. and also leaving other developed countries. Manufacturing has been moving to the less developed parts of the global economy and particularly to China. China has become the location of choice for most manufacturing. Uh, as that has been happening, uh, our economists and our business leaders have been uh, saying that uh, we're going to be a services economy. And we're going to do the sophisticated design and development and, and finance and consulting and so forth. Uh, and that, um, uh, and they've been saying that, you know, the services economy, because it requires more face-to-face -face contact and so forth, that this is an economy that will be more fixed and immobile. Well, the internet changes that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one of the amazing new developments is a whole new industry called medical tourism. And uh, if you go to the Apollo Hospital in Hyderabad, you find that uh, medical tourism is going to be a billion dollar a year export industry this year for India. And the way this works is, um, you know, I noticed you were limping a little bit walking over here and maybe you need a new knee. Well, if you need a new knee, I've got a deal for you. You call the Apollo Hospital, they will uh, give you a package. Uh, round trip airfare, San Francisco to Hyderabad, first class, uh, new knee, private uh, nursing uh, care and recovery care, side trip to the Taj Mahal, uh, <laughs> all done by US board certified surgeons and at 20% of the cost of the procedure here uh, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a billion dollar industry. Whoever thought that you would outsource the doctor? Mm -hmm. But that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. so, so if we try to sum up what, what you're saying is, in, in across the board, students used to come here from abroad to get educated and stay and work here. Now they're going back. Uh, uh, right. We used to create centers of manufacturing and high technology with all the spin-offs that that entailed. That was here because we were the with the brain for this. Now that is moving abroad. So again and again, what we're seeing is we're losing the capacity here and as part of our previous strategies to further development there we're, we're still on that track in a way uh, shooting ourselves in the foot is that a fair summary well I think it's uh, it's a it's a good uh, <clears throat> quick summary it's a little bit uh, maybe Fast. overly drawn <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we're still a very powerful economy and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, I mean, sitting right here in Berkeley, we still are getting a lot of foreign students. And, and uh, in fact, in recent years, many of the startups, the new startup companies in Silicon Valley, have been started up by, uh, by students who came here and stayed here, particularly Indians. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not as if there's a rush out of the U.S. But what is happening, and it, and it's, it reflects positive developments, because India and China are now growing, and they are in the global economy, and they've learned how to develop. There's opportunity there. In the past, the students would come here because there was no opportunity there, and they would stay here because there was better opportunity than there was there. Well, now there's opportunity, and they're going back to take advantage of it. That's terrific. We want that. It, the, the most dangerous thing in the world would be the failure of China and India. Uh, that would be dangerous. And so we want them to succeed. And to the extent that these students who come here and get skills and go back and f can facilitate and foster that, it's fantastic. But the other thing that's, that is happening uh, is that uh, we are not maintaining our own development of our, of our own skills. We're not investing in the infrastructure. Uh, we are not um, 
providing adequate secondary education so that uh, our students are moving on. If you look at the graduate courses uh, at, at the leading U.S. technological institutions, uh, majority of the PhD and master's degree candidates are not Americans, they're from various foreign countries, which nothing wrong with that. In fact, thank God they're there because they help support those programs. But we need to be getting more Americans into those programs as well, and that's where we're falling apart. And the other thing that's happening is that uh, as kind of a, con a continuing a kind of hangover from those days when I was out promoting Dutch exports to the U.S. market, mm -hmm. we still have a structure which tends to make it more attractive to put production and now even R&D uh, and sophisticated services abroad rather than keeping them here. For example, the dollar is overvalued. Um, in a way, we have outsourced the management of the dollar to Asia. Uh, we, we have a situation in which uh, China has been pegging its currency to the dollar, it just recently revalued by about 2%. Uh, but essentially, China is managing the value of its currency against the dollar. Japan does the same thing. Japan does it in a different way. Japan intervenes in currency markets. Whenever it feels the dollar is getting too weak, it buys dollars to strengthen the dollar. The other Asian countries do the same thing. So the Asian central banks or finance ministries tend to manage the value of the dollar to keep the dollar strong. Well, that has great benefits for American consumers. It means that imports are cheap, it keeps mm -hmm. inflation low, uh, it tends to keep interest rates down in the U.S., so if you're a consumer, it feels good. But if you're a producer, if you're investing in new plants and equipment or R&D, it's expensive. And so there's a tendency to move it abroad. But because of the linkages, uh, and this, is, this word linkage is extremely important. Um, our economic theory tends to kind of assume that all markets are commodity markets, uh, like wheat or coffee or oil. Well, a lot of markets are, but if you're making semiconductors or you're making advanced telecommunications equipment, you've got to have a connection between the laboratory and the engineering division and the manufacturing. And when those linkages are broken, then you tend to lose the ability to move on in staying at the cutting edge of the technology. And that's where we have a real problem. Now, I want to pursue this thing about the dollar because I think it's very important and I think many uh, in the, uh, people in the general public don't understand it. So, so you, at one point in your book you say that in the second wave of globalization, the, the era in which you grew up and, and, and uh, uh, fulfilled your career, you speak of the second wave of globalization as borrow, spend, and consume. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do that because in this, this financial structure, international financial structure, when we didn't have to we didn't have the right. money to pay, we just printed right. dollars. America and has a privileged position, yeah. which most people don't understand. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's take oil, mm -hmm. best example. Um, oil is priced globally in dollars. Uh, everybody in the world buys oil with dollars. Now, for the United States, since we, we own the dollar, we print dollars. So if we need oil, uh, I'm simplifying, but essentially if we need oil, President calls up the Secretary of the Treasury and says, "Mr. Secretary, would you just, you know, call the printing, printing, uh, government printing office over <laughs> here? They call them in, tell them to run off a few more uh, dollars, mm -hmm. and then we send those dollars. We give those dollars to the Mexicans or the Venezuelans or the Saudi Arabians, and we get oil. So essentially, we're giving them paper, and they're giving us oil." Mm -hmm. No other country can do that. If you're French or Brazilian or Japanese or Chinese, you've got to make something. You have to make a Lexus or common bear cheese or, or orange juice. You've got to make something and sell it to the Americans to get dollars. Mm -hmm. And then you use those dollars to go get your oil. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody else in the world, in order to buy oil, they have to invest, they have to save, they have to make something mm -hmm. and sell something. We, on the other hand, all we have to do is run the printing presses and send out dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what that has meant is that there's no discipline on us. It means that we don't have to make anything. We don't have to invest. We don't have to save. Uh, we can run big uh, government budget deficits. I mean, other countries in the world uh, cannot run the kind of deficits that we run. Or if they do, they have to have enough saving to finance their own deficits. We don't have to do that. All we have to do is spend. Uh, and as long as the rest of the world accepts dollars, 
everything is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, and so uh, we've built an economy based on high levels of consumption, subsidized <laughs> from all the way back in the late 1940s, subsidized through the tax system, uh, urging Americans to consume. Um, and we've made it easy to borrow. Uh, and so that's what we do. We borrow and consume. And uh, the rest of the world then saves and invests and sells to us mm -hmm. uh, and finances our consumption. Uh, and uh, that's how the global system works. And, and importantly, uh, for a place like China or India, uh, producing these products to sell in our market um, um, uh, creates new jobs, right. basically. And they, yeah, they yeah. have a large right, right. surplus of, right. of, of population to do that. Uh, let, let just, I want to mm -hmm. emphasize one point very briefly, which, which you've already touched mm -hmm. on, but in this new global economy, these new entrants like China and uh, and India really have each defined a niche for themselves. And you talk about that. In China, as you mentioned, they have become the global manufacturer par excellence. And India, uh, really the, the software uh, and service right, uh, right. Uh, 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 key player. Well, India represents kind of a new twist. Um, China is following a well-tried track. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan developed this model of uh, export-led growth based on manufacturing. Uh, I mean, the Japanese formula was that you suppress domestic consumption, you compel saving, the savings is channeled into mass production strategic industries like automobiles and machinery, and you export like crazy while managing the currency to keep your currency relatively weak against the dollar. The Koreans looked at that and they said, we can do that too. And then the Taiwanese and, the, and, 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 and others followed. So in a way, China is the last tiger mm -hmm. following this well-worn track. India, on the other hand, is a new twist. Uh, nobody thought about doing this in services. Uh, but it turned out, turns out that the Indians have a lot of highly skilled people, a lot of them educated right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the advent of the internet, suddenly, uh, all of these skills could easily be transported uh, to the U.S. without having to actually physically be there. Mm -hmm. And so this represented kind of a whole new uh, step uh, and has brought to the services area the same competitive phenomena and dynamics that we've been watching in, in, in manufacturing for the last 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. Now uh, let's pick up, go back to your career because you, you know, after you uh, uh, were in business, you, you actually were were in, excuse me, you 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 served in the Reagan administration right. in the Commerce Department right. under the Secretary of uh, Commerce. Uh, talk a little about that experience and what you learned about what the limits of government can do. To, to deal with this, this new era? Well, it was a great experience. And um, I learned a tremendous amount. Um, I, I went to Washington with the attitudes that I think many American businessmen typically have of, of the government as being more of a hindrance than a help, and of uh, bureaucrats as being um, kind of second rate. You know, if they were really any good, they'd be out in the private sector, I think is a common attitude in much of America. What I found is that there are a lot of really hardworking people in Washington, and that a lot of those bureaucrats in Washington are very, very skilled people and very dedicated people. And I learned a tremendous amount from them. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, what I came to realize is, is I mean, I, I learned so many things, but a couple of really important things are, one, that um, there is in the United States a widespread, has developed in the U.S., a widespread, um, and maybe it goes all the way back to the beginning of our, of our history, but a, a, a suspicion and a, a dislike of government. And in fact, if you go on the speaking circuit, a sure laugh line is to say, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. <laughs> say that in any gathering and Americans laugh uh, <laughs> because they just don't think of the government mm -hmm. you know, as something to help. Uh, and uh, because of that, <clears throat> uh, we often, in international negotiations, 
are involved in negotiations with governments that have industrial policies, Japan being uh, the prime example, where the government and the industries work very closely together, uh, and where they think in terms of setting national economic goals or industrial targets or, or reaching certain technological uh, uh, targets and working together to do that. And this is all very uh, uh, strange mm -hmm. uh, to our concept of how economies should be run and how things should be done. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what is also very interesting is that uh, because of our, uh, our hesitance about government, we eschew uh, industrial policy. Um, we say government should not pick winners and losers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yet what's interesting is that, of course, we have a big government. Um, in fact, we have a much bigger government than, most, than many of the other governments in the world that we deal with. And our government makes uh, important decisions about resource allocation. Uh, our Defense Department spends an enormous amount of money. Uh, our other departments, Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, all spend a lot of money. So decisions have to be made about how the money is spent and for what purposes. Interestingly, in the U.S., those decisions are not made with regard to any overarching economic criteria. Uh, there's no coordination between the various interests that uh, work on how that money gets allocated. So in effect, we have, we do have an industrial policy. We have a de facto policy. Uh, often it's very confused. Uh, because we, we tell ourselves that we shouldn't have a, such a policy, we don't want such a policy. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that in international negotiations, particularly in trade negotiations, um, we go into these negotiations always kind of on the basis of the premise that the other countries' economies work more or less the same as ours. Um, that is, we're thinking that they are market economies, we're thinking that they are capitalist, uh, they are members of the World Trade Organization or of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development or the IMF. Uh, and so we tend to begin with the premise that uh, they're playing by, they're playing the same game and pretty much under the same rules that we are. Um, when in fact the truth is that they're not, mostly they're not. Um, I talked about export-led growth. Most of the Asian countries are pursuing policies of export-led growth. They're pursuing policies of strategic trade, which means that as a matter of policy, they aim to have trade surpluses. As a matter of policy, they aim to accumulate dollar reserves. As a matter of policy, they tend to favor certain kinds of industries over other kinds of industries. Uh, and uh, as a matter of policy, they build incentives into their economy to save and to invest in certain ways. They use the market, but the market is not necessarily an end in itself. The market is a tool, not an end in itself. Whereas for the Americans, the market is an end in itself. You know, if it's a market decision, we accept it as a legitimate decision, uh, regardless of what the, what the results are. Whereas many of our trading partners are looking for particular kinds of results. If the market helps them get there, terrific. But if not, then the market can always have a helping hand. We don't recognize that. And so we tend to go into these negotiations um, and, and if we have difficulties, we tend to assume that our trading partners are somehow being unfair or they're cheating. And then we say, well, we got to get tough and, and we want to file trade cases or what have you. Uh, whereas we'd be much better served by recognizing we've got two different systems here and we need to somehow adjust the interaction of these two different systems. A good example would be the Chinese attempt now uh, cancel to buy this California oil company. Well, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. It is a good example. Yeah, I mean, relate that yeah, to what yeah, you just said. Sure. In other words, because, right. because they have a strategic economic goal mm -hmm. in mind here because of their long-term energy needs, uh, whereas our system, you know, in the first instance, there is a reaction. <coughs> well, well, of course, this, this, was, the this was a very interesting case because it does put the Americans in a somewhat... Um, you know, kind of a two-sided uh, situation. The China National Oil Company is just that. It's a national oil company, a uh, majority owned by the government of China. So it made a bid to buy an American company, Unicol, 
Um, and the reason that they wanted to buy Unicol is because China, growing very rapidly, uh, is desperate to achieve a secure supply of energy. Doesn't produce enough energy internally, needs to get its energy from outside, wants a secure supply, is trying to buy reserves. Unicol has big energy reserves in Asia, so Chinese National Oil Company interested in buying those reserves. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, so it made this bid, which generated enormous resistance in the U.S., one on the basis that it's a government-owned company, and uh, that somehow, therefore, it means it doesn't operate according to market rules, which is, in fact, true. The, the, uh, the bid was, I mean, because it is a national government-owned company, its uh, lending terms and borrowing terms are different than, than those in a normal uh, market-based company. So there's an objection here in the U.S. that somehow this was illegitimate because the China, Chinese oil company was a government-owned company. Um, and at the same time, there was a sense in the U.S. of uh, threat to national security, which frankly struck me as very odd because, um, one, <clears throat> British Petroleum uh, is a government-owned <laughs> uh, uh, company. And we never objected to British Petroleum doing, making any investments. Uh, the uh, Kuwait uh, National Oil Company is government owned and it's made investments here in the US. The Venezuelan uh, oil company, the same thing. So it seemed a little bit uh, inconsistent that we were objecting to the Chinese when we hadn't objected to other national oil companies making these investments in the US. Uh, and secondly, but secondly, more importantly, there's really nothing strategic about this. The oil is in, the, these reserves are in Asia, whether Chevron has them or Unicol has them or, or the Chinese National Oil Company has them, that oil is going to be sold in Asia. It's not going to affect the price in the U.S. It's not going to affect the supply in the U.S. So it was a very, uh, uh, you know, unusual reaction, but emblematic of this um, asymmetry between the U.S. market approach and the rest of the world's kind of mixed economy approach. Throughout your career, you've been involved in, you know, the, the Foreign Service, uh, in business, government advisor, uh, and now running a, a think tank in Washington. I'm, I would be interesting to draw out of you the geopolitical implications, as you see it, of, of, of these new developments. And, and one way to look at this is to to, say, to compare the threat posed by the Soviet Union, the threat posed by Japan in two earlier periods, and kind of compare that to the threat as you see it, if it is a threat, posed by China and India. What are the difference in those three threats? Actually, I think, I think frankly, if we <clears throat> talk about threat, I think the major threat is the threat we pose to ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me explain that. <clears throat> the Soviet You're talking Union, about the present period now. Yes, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Soviet Union presented a clear, classic, um, traditional, geopolitical, uh, military security threat. It was also an ideological threat, but it was something that, again, was kind of in a classic, traditional um, vein of international dealing. And we responded to that uh, with alliances, with a military buildup, by becoming superior to the Soviets in technology, uh, and by uh, building an alliance system that became also uh, our trading and our economic partners, and uh, as they became wealthier, uh, the whole uh, free world system clearly demonstrated superiority to the Soviet system. Um, <clears throat> The uh, trade frictions that broke out with Japan in the 1970s and the 1980s were uh, certainly not a threat in that sense. There, Japan never had any ambitions, uh, either ideologically or militarily. Um, they were more a challenge to American technological and economic leadership. Um, and they spotlighted, they highlighted some weaknesses uh, in the American economic structure and in the American economic policies, uh, <clears throat> which gave rise to a vigorous debate domestically about how we might have to change our system and vigorous debate internationally about how our system was interacting with the Japanese and with other systems. Now, I think that the current uh, relationship 
uh, and current economic structure that's evolving, and particularly with the rapid growth of India and China and the advent of the internet and so forth, um, is really in a way a continuation of the uh, the challenge that Japan began to pose in the 1980s. Uh, I don't think of it as a threat, because I think the word threat is too strong. And um, again, as I said earlier, we want the success of China and India. Uh, we have to hope for their success. But the key thing here is this. Um, we have tended as Americans to take our economic uh, success for granted. We've tended to, it's kind of a birthright of being Americans. Uh, and we have attributed it to our own virtuosity and to, you know, the virtues of our system, our, our entrepreneurial, flexible, free market uh, system. And there's a lot of truth to that. But we uh, sometimes forget that we've also been very fortunate. Uh, we, in, we have this huge continental country with enormous resources. We had the first mass market in history. Um, <clears throat> we, we've just, we've been a combination of, of uh, you know, hard work and, and, and skills, but also uh, good fortune. Um, and that um, our policies are not necessarily always the best policies. Um, and so, for example, we have very low savings rate in the United States. We have a relatively low investment rate. Um, our educational, our secondary educational system is, uh, you know, not as good as it ought to be. And not as good as that in some other leading countries. Um, there are inevitably are areas uh, in the economy where you need to have cooperation between various levels of government and business. Ours is not always the best. And so what's being highlighted here is some of those weaknesses in the U.S. economy. Uh, and I think the real question is not so much what the Chinese or the Indians do, but it's how do we respond to correct our own weaknesses. Now, the second thing that's happening is that um, the, for a long time, there's been a very unnatural imbalance in the global system in the sense that the United States has 5% of the world's population, but we account for 30% of the world's production. Uh, well, that's not natural. Uh, and, and it can't last and it shouldn't last. So China, let's remember that for most of its history, for most of the world's history, China was the biggest economy. Back in 1400, when Henry the Navigator began sending his captains to see if they could get around Africa, the area that we now call China and India accounted for 75% of global GDP. Uh, Europe was primitive and there was no United States. Um, well, we're going back towards more of a balance. China is growing rapidly. It's again going to become the biggest economy. Eventually, India will become the biggest economy. Now, when I say biggest economy, that doesn't mean richest. That doesn't mean that they're going to be the richest economy on a per capita basis. The United States will remain in that position. But in terms of overall size of, of GDP, China will become the biggest economy in the next 30 or 40 years, and by the end of the century, India will be the biggest. So the United States will, or, or the NAFTA area, will be number three or maybe number four, because the EU, the European Union, will also be a very, very large economy. Now, nothing wrong with that, <clears throat> but it means that certain adjustments have to be made. It means that in global institutions like the World Trade Organization or the International Monetary Fund, the weight of the United States is going to be relatively less. Our ability to dictate what happens in those organizations is going to be relatively less. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to negotiate. We're going to have to have allies and, and supporters in these organizations rather than just coming in and saying our policy is. And that's a whole new world for Americans. We're not used to that. And we need to think about how do we handle this. Um, I like to think of it as like it's a game of bridge. Uh, and uh, I think the United States still has the best hand. I think we have more aces and more trumps than anybody else. But as you know, if you play bridge, you can have a great hand, but if you misplay the hand, you can still lose. Mm -hmm. We need to think carefully about how we play the hand. Mm -hmm. what, what are the aces and what should leadership 
do to play the right hand? Well, uh, a big ace is that we have a, a system of transparency and a rule of law. Uh, our institutions are stable and predictable and, uh, and, and open. Um, it, this reduces the risk of doing business in the United States. It makes the United States uh, a business-friendly, economic, investment-friendly environment. Um, and, um, you know, here in Silicon, in, in the East, here in the Bay Area, in, in the Silicon Valley area, we think of risk-taking. And we think of Americans as being a risk-taking people. And, and we are a risk-taking people. But one reason that we take risks is because actually we reduce the risk. Um, our system of stable institutions reduces the risk mm. of making these investments. Uh, a second element of our system, very, very important, is, and this is part of being an open society, uh, is that uh, you can fail and try again. In fact, uh, I remember being surprised once when I was in a meeting, in a venture capital meeting, where a, uh, an entrepreneur was presenting his business plan, uh, hoping for funding, and the venture capital team was asking him what he had done in the past. And uh, he was a little hesitant because he'd had a couple of failures. But he, he was honest and he mentioned that he'd had a couple of business failures. And the venture capitalist reaction was, fantastic, <laughs> great, oh man, now you know what not to do, you know? And so it was like you couldn't get the money unless you had failed. Mm -hmm. Well, try that in Japan, try that in Germany, you know? Mm -hmm. In those countries, you get one shot, if you get one shot, but only one. So um, that means that in the US, you can fail and try again, and that's very important, and we need to maintain that. The other thing is that we do have superior uh, institutions of higher learning. We do have the best elite universities in the world. Our secondary education system has real problems, but our elite universities are the best. We have a fantastic infrastructure built up over the years, the internet being a good example of our investment over the years in infrastructure. Uh, we still have leadership in many important areas of technology. Biotech, uh, investment in biotech in the US is greater than in the rest of the world combined. Um, <clears throat> So we have a lot of strengths. Uh, the problem is that, let's take the internet, DARPA's budget is being reduced. We're not reinvesting in these things that have given us such strength. Um, our elite universities are the elite universities, but uh, as I said earlier, they're dependent now in their graduate programs on having foreign students fill those classrooms because our secondary schools and our secondary education is not feeding sufficient students into those programs. Um, so, uh, as I said, we got good cards, but we ain't playing them very well right now. <clears throat> if, if students were watching this interview and fascinated by your career and so on, and, and, and they wanted suggestions about how one can learn to lead, how one can lead to make the changes that you're talking about. Because you're talking about very important uh, adjustments where government and business have to play new roles. Uh, how, do we, how do we work to do that? You started right. a, uh, a non-governmental organization. Right. Is that the way to go? Is it public education? What? Uh, public education is a very important element of it. Um, becoming involved is a very important element of it. Um, one of the things I've learned in Washington is that this really is a democracy that we have here. It responds to the people. A problem that we have is that we as a people are not in active enough, we're not involving ourselves enough uh, to direct our own government. Uh, there tends to be a feeling that it's all kind of in Washington, it's all so big and little me, I can't have any impact. And that's just exactly the opposite of the truth. The truth is that, um, and in fact, I, in, the, in writing this book, I had a very interesting experience. I've come out to, here to the Valley and talked to a lot of venture capital people and, and uh, high-tech executives. And in all my interviews, particularly with the high-tech executives, I would say, are you concerned uh, about uh, the dynamics here of the, the movement offshore, 
of important elements of technology and the movement offshore of important uh, elements of services and so forth. And to a man and a woman, uh, these high-tech CEOs would say, yes, I am concerned. In fact, Craig Barrett, the uh, chairman of Intel, made this fantastic comment that, that I think captures it well. He said, you know, look, Intel's going to be okay. You know, we've got our installations in China and India and elsewhere, and regardless of of how the U.S. government operates, Intel will be okay. He said, but I worry, he said, I'm a grandfather, and I do wonder what my children and grandchildren are going to be doing. And I, felt, I found that same concern being expressed by many executives. And then I would say to them, well, if you're concerned, um, uh, you know, what are you doing about it? And the answer always was, well, listen, you know, I'm running my company, and I have a fiduciary responsibility to my shareholders to run my company as best as I can. And uh, this broader uh, issue of U.S. long-term economic development or technological leadership, the guys in Washington are supposed to be taking care of it. Hmm. And you know, I had to smile because um, these very sophisticated business leaders didn't always understand how our system works. When I explained to them, listen, there's nobody in Washington who's, uh, you know, who's looking at that. I mean, there are people in Washington who are looking at elements of that. But the first thing that happens in Washington, if a trade negotiation is coming up, um, or if there's a, some kind of a technology policy decision to be made, the first thing that the guys in Washington say is, well, what does Silicon Valley think of that? What do the CEOs think of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's kind of Gaston Alphonse, you know, what do you think? Well, what do you think? Because there's really nobody in charge. Our system is very open. The people are in charge. But if the people don't exert themselves, nobody's in charge. Mm -hmm. And we really do need our citizens to take their responsibility as citizens seriously. But, but is that why you started this, uh, uh, this it's thing? It's one reason I did, yeah. yeah. It's one reason I did. I started it because I felt there was a great need for public education. And I would say for young people, thinking about their careers and thinking about the future, their own future in the context of the future of the country, a broad education is so important. We do live in a global economy. Last year, here's a factoid for you, last year more Chinese students in China took the SATs in English than Americans. Um, <laughs> wherever you go in the world, uh, whether it's China or whether it's Europe or Latin America, those people know more about America than Americans know about them. Now to some extent, that's to be expected. We, after all, are the world power. We affect them more than they affect us. But still, we're living in a global economy. Uh, Americans typically don't speak anybody else's language. Uh, and as I said, Americans typically don't have the same understanding of the history and the background of the other guy that they have of us. We need to correct that. Uh, we need to become as broadly knowledgeable as the rest of the world. And there's a tendency in the U.S to be channeled. Uh, businessmen know a lot about business, but not much about government. Government knows a lot about government, but not much about business. The two tend to be suspicious of each other. Uh, people in nonprofits tend to know a lot about nonprofits, but the thing is that these all work together. And I just can't emphasize enough the importance of a broad uh, educational background. Well, uh, Clyde, on, Clyde, on that note, I want to thank you very much for being with us today. And, and I know people will want to read your book because uh, if I haven't already said it, I'll say it now. It, it's really a lucid account of all of the, the changes taking place in the, in the world economy and the challenges they pose uh, for the United States. I'll show the cover of your book uh, one more time. And thank you very much uh, for being with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.